Advocate or Bill? Make um, sure your cell phone's next to it. Grant. Okay. Am I on too? I think I'm on. You are. All right. Good evening. Can I get one of these? On behalf of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I'd like to welcome you to yeah. our latest lecture in our Dialogues of Discovery series. Today, we're particularly pleased to have Jeremy Freeman as our speaker. Jeremy was a, I would like to say long time, but he's not old enough, but he was here as, as a staff a member. He, we hired him to run a research group right after he got his PhD, and he joined us in May of 2013, where he worked both in experimental neuroscience and in computational neuroscience. And during that time, he got more and more interested in the problem of how scientists were going to deal with very large data sets and distribute them to their colleagues. And he began to develop a plan for this. And then he needed a bigger platform at which to implement that plan. So he moved six months ago to his present position as the manager of computational biology for something called the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which Jeremy assures me he is going to explain to you. He was a number two employee of that initiative, the number one employee. Those of you who are regulars will have met her. Corey Bogman gave a lecture here two years ago, a long time Howard Hughes investigator and professor at Rockefeller who left that position to lead this initiative. Now, there's a lot of other information about Jeremy where he went to school and whatever else in this little book, so I'm not gonna repeat that, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you, Jerry, for the uh, very warm introduction. Um, it's really awesome to, uh, and a little bit surreal to be back here. Um, it's only been a few months, but uh, it's been really fun to sit at the table that I was used to sit at in Bob's um, and reconnect with lots of uh, colleagues more than I had a chance to talk to you today. Um, and I'm really excited to be here uh, today to talk to all of you um, and tell you a little bit about uh, what I've been up to, as well as my former Janelli colleagues, what I've been up to in the last few months. Um, so as Jerry said, uh, I, I recently transitioned. Um, so I was here for uh, between three and four years, this beautiful uh, location. And um, for the last four months, I've been uh, at this slightly less interesting looking uh, <laughs> building in Palo Alto. Um, so this is actually the, the headquarters of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, we've already moved once since I got there. Um, so. It's uh, very much just getting started. Um, and uh, for those of you who knew me here, I spent a lot of time uh, basically working out of my office, which was Bob's, our cafe. Uh, and I'm, I'm sad to say I haven't really found an alternative to Bob's yet. Um, this is our kitchen in the office, which uh, is not quite as pleasant a place to <laughs> sit all day. Um, but I'm still searching the cafe scene to find the right alternative. Um, what I want to do in this talk is uh, uh, really share with you a vision um, for how I think about um, trying to accelerate the process of science um, and how to make everything we do in science and especially in biology uh, more effective, more efficient, more collaborative. Um, that, that vision uh, really began here. So I want to sort of tell a story that is about things I learned uh, in all the different collaborations I was involved in here at Genalia and how that has now informed the way we're thinking about uh, trying to scale up and sort of scale out the scope um, or increase the scope of some of those efforts. And uh, I'm gonna basically give a very brief, sort of very short highlight reel of a couple sort of cool collaborations I was involved in here that got me thinking about some of these problems um, and then transition to tell you a little bit about what the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is, what we're trying to do, um, and give some concrete examples of actual projects that were getting off the ground and give you a little bit of a sort of insider's view of what it's like to be in the middle of a crazy uh, initiative that's just starting, um, which has been really exciting. So the, the real kind of key word for uh, all of my time at Genalia was collaboration. I sort of came here knowing that I wanted to work with and work closely with lots of the groups that were here doing really incredibly uh, cool developments of new experimental technologies in neuroscience. And I was eager to collaborate with them and I didn't know exactly what that would look like. 
Um, but this place was, in, everyone here, incredibly welcoming to um, forming those collaborations, and I got involved in a lot of really awesome projects um, right off the ground. So those involved uh, generally trying to understand the relationship between large patterns of brain activity in animals and understand the relationship or how those patterns of brain activity drive and determine behaviors. And doing that in a variety of different systems. So just in the building here, there are flies, there are zebrafish, there are mice. Um, along the way, I ended up doing some work in each of those domains. Um, so did a lot of stuff uh, working with Misha Ahrens and Philip Keller. Um, and other colleagues working in the larval zebrafish. This is a system where we can uh, genetically engineer these animals so that they have their neurons uh, light up under a microscope and then put them in various environments where we can simultaneously do imaging and electrophysiology and behavioral recording while preventing visual stimuli. Um, we also did a lot of work, um, and I'll show a couple uh, sort of live movies from work in the mouse. So this is an animal capable of more complex behaviors probably than a larval zebrafish, um, quite a few. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, this is working uh, with a, a very, very close collaborator here, Carl Sabota, um, who's right over here, um, as well as postdocs uh, Nick Safranyev and Simon Prone and, and other members of the lab and other uh, members here at Genelia. Um, working in systems where we can put these mice uh, in environments where they're performing complex behaviors and then use various tools, including electrophysiology and also imaging to monitor patterns of brain activity and understand the relationship between brain and behavior. So to actually show what a little bit of that looks like, um, this uh, was an incredibly cool system developed by a, a postdoc, Nick Zafranyev. Um, it's a tactile virtual reality environment. Um, so the, the goal here is to have a mouse doing a really cool complex behavior, but without actually moving, so that we can, while it's fixed in place, simultaneously be using a microscope of, of its head to monitor patterns of brain activity. So the way this works is the mouse is on this little ball, and there are motors um, in this incredibly cool system that Nick designed. There are motors and walls, and the walls are moving around the mouse to make it think that it's inside of an environment. And that environment is depicted on the right, where the little dot that's moving through this maze represents the mouse's position inside of this environment. So you know, we don't really know what the mouse thinks, but to a first approximation, uh, we imagine that this, at least mm, to some degree, conveys the experience of running through a maze. And of course, it gets, we do this while the mouse is not actually moving physically anywhere. Um, because it's not moving anywhere, uh, we can put an incredibly large microscope above it. So that little ball over there, that was the mouse, um, which is about as big as Nick's little head. Um, and there's a very large microscope on top. So this was actually an instrument, a microscope uh, called the mesoscope, developed uh, here at Genalia. Um, and it's uh, sort of an evolution of many technologies used to monitor increasingly large patterns of brain activity uh, in the brain of animals like the mouse while they're performing complex behaviors. Uh, the data that come out of this giant instrument um, looks something like this. So in this movie, we are uh, watching neural activity. Each of these little small white spots is a single neuron. Um, so this animal is uh, uh, engineered to have uh, proteins in, in the neurons that fluoresce when the neurons are active. That means we see their activity um, captured by this microscope um, in the form of light. And uh, we can watch in this single movie the activity of thousands of neurons while an animal is doing this kind of complex behavior. Um, and you can look at the raw data. Obviously, just looking at this movie, it's not obvious what's going on, especially because I haven't told you what the animal is doing. Um, so there are a wide variety of analyses that uh, uh, we and many others uh, have done, have tried to develop to make sense of these data and to understand the relationship between the brain activity and behavior. One sort of very simple example of that kind of approach um, is an image like this, where we are color coding now um, individual neurons based on the relationship between those neurons' activity and different parameters of the animal's behavior. So in this particular case, we're looking at the relationship between the activity and where the walls were relative to the animal. So this could be related to its sense of space relative to its environment. Um, that's the blue. And then also neurons that appear to be related to the animal's locomotion, how quickly it's moving. That's the orange. And then the green are ones that we don't really know what they're doing. Um, so there ought to be a lot of mystery. The brain is not well understood. Um, so it's just one, one example of really probably five or 10 I could give of just really wonderful collaborations I, I was involved in uh, here at Genelia, you're really doing science, but then also thinking about how to develop approaches to uh, data analysis and working with these data to try to understand um, these kinds of relationships. And 
over several years of being involved in these projects, um, especially because I was doing it with so many different groups, there were certain themes that emerged um, that started to, sort of as Jerry said, make me think not just about these particular problems in neuroscience, but some more sort of general uh, patterns about how we think about data in science in general. Um, and one sort of picture I'd like to use um, is I think there's this notion that we all maybe have, both in science and outside of science, that data analysis should, just shouldn't be that complicated. Um, that you know we have movies like the ones I showed you, and we, that's our raw data, and then we have results. And those are things we send each other by email, or they're the papers we publish. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward path to get from A to B. Um, but the reality, um, any sort of lab you go into and start talking about what this actually looks like on the ground, is that it's something more like this. There's an incredibly, anyone who's run a lab surely knows this picture, um, and, 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 or anyone who's sort of done data analysis of any form. Um, I would say the same thing is true in industry, by the way. Um, it's just very complicated once you sort of get into the weeds. Um, there's lots of different sort of representations and re-representations of data that has to happen in order to extract meaning from it. Um, and it sort of even makes it even more complicated is that this kind of big pile of spaghetti is happening separately within every single lab. Um, so individual labs will, will build tools to solve this problem of going from data to results, and not entirely, but to a large extent, individual groups sort of end up needing to do this on their own because each group often is solving a very unique problem that's specific to the needs of their lab. So now we have the situation where hundreds of labs working on related aspects of biology have sort of invented or reinvented lots of com complexity to solve certain kinds of analysis problems. And as a result, it's very hard to, for example, take this one squiggly arrow that I developed in my lab and share it with another lab that had their own pile of squiggly arrows. Um, and that, you know, we, we, have, we have to talk about reproducibility in science, that it's really important, uh, sort of maybe the most important thing about science is that if I've done something, uh, my fellow scientists should be able to reproduce what I've done. Um, the more that, what we do depends on analysis, and the more analysis looks like this, the harder reproducibility becomes. So this is something that I thought about a lot, um, and uh, basically reached a point where I was thinking more about these broader problems um, uh, than the sort of neuroscience specific issues, um, because it just seems very fundamental. Um, and I would say a, a very sort of brief summary of a lot of what I worked on here at Genalia was trying to find ways of making neuroscience and the process of doing neuroscience more efficient, more effective, and more collaborative. Um, and largely that was through the use of software and computation and various kinds of technologies that power the sort of modern world that we're all uh, used to. So there's just been enormous advances in computing, um, in using uh, cloud computing, so doing uh, com computation not on local machines in our homes, but in uh, various kinds of cloud distributed servers, um, large web companies that have made a fortune on this, um, and lots of technology developed in the process that really can be of value and can, can help some of these areas. Um, so I became very interested in trying to use those approaches and apply them to problems in neuroscience to achieve this goal. And basically along the way, realized that uh, perhaps obviously most of this is actually not specific to neuroscience. These are very general problems um, and they affect uh, definitely all of biology if not all of science. And really the question is how can we use these kinds of technologies to make all of science more effective, more efficient, and more collaborative. Um, so this was sort of on my mind a few months ago, um, and sort of ideas were brewing about what it would look like to try to scale out some of these things. And I was incredibly excited to see an announcement uh, from Corey Bargman about something called the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So uh, this was just announced about, uh, I want to say, uh, six, five or six months ago. Um, and she, in this announcement, was describing a vision that was more or less exactly uh, uh, sort of what I had been feeling um, in terms of the need for finding ways to accelerate science and, and make it more efficient, more effective, and more collaborative. Um, so I basically was incredibly enthusiastic about this. I talked to her, um, and about three weeks later, I had decided I was going there. Um, so she, uh, Corey, is the leader of what is a very small but rapidly growing team um, the science part of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, and I'm, she's my boss, and I'm working with her uh, to develop uh, really an entire program that is at the intersection of science and computation. 
and trying to find ways of using computation and software um, and technology to accelerate science. Um, for a little bit of context about the initiative as a whole, um, it was started by uh, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg um, actually about a year and a half ago. Um, so they decided to devote, um, I believe it's 99% of, of all of their wealth to philanthropy. And it started with a focus on education. Um, so they, uh, uh, Priscilla for a long time has been very interested in education, um, Mark as well. And they uh, started some work around education. About some portion of time into there, um, they started exploring other kinds of initiatives they could get involved in. And it was several months ago that they announced uh, there would be an, an independent focus, uh, part of this whole umbrella, focused on science. Um, and the goal that they set out, uh, sort of hinted at in this slide, um, is to support basic science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. And if you're anything like me, when you heard this, um, it sounded crazy. Uh, and I do think it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, it's very ambitious, and it's good to have ambitious goals. Um, what, and maybe I've just drank in the Kool-Aid, but uh, one way to make this seem a little bit less crazy, if we were to say you wanted to achieve these goals in a thousand years, um, it might not quite seem so outlandish that that might be possible. Um, and especially given that we're not saying cure necessarily, it's sort of cure, prevent, or manage, to achieve that in a thousand years might be possible. Um, if that's true, then another way to ask the question is, how can we make a thousand years of progress in only a hundred years? And if you think about it that way, what we could instead think about is how do we accelerate the process by which all of science happens? And especially how do we accelerate the process of basic science? Because you can't cure or prevent or manage anything unless you understand it. There's a lot we don't understand about basic biology. And I think what we're now thinking about and what might be the sort of unique perspective we at this initiative can bring is finding ways to accelerate the process of science and especially ways of using technology to do that as fast as possible. Um, so this of course aligns and goes back to what I was saying about using software and using the web and all kinds of new technologies that we have now to really accelerate the process by which scientists work. Um, and one sort of very uh, simple way to put that, um, this comes from a, a, a one, uh, incredible scientist um, and colleague David Tank at Princeton, um, who uh, put it really well. He said in his lab, they used to spend about 80% of the time doing experiments and 20% of their time uh, doing the rest. So sort of analyzing data, working with data. And that now the equation's basically flipped. So they spend 20% of their time doing experiments and 80% of their time um, working with the data and not sort of doing cool data analysis, just sort of doing the stuff that nobody really wants to do, managing it, formatting it, moving it. Um, and I think this has been echoed certainly in lots of groups that I've talked to um, that really due to the various complexities in modern biology, the balance has shifted. Um, and I, I truly believe that even if sort of accelerating science simply meant making tools and technologies so that labs could spend as much of their time as possible doing experiments and making discoveries instead of dealing with all the rest, um, that already we would make a lot of progress. Um, so at least for me and the, what I'm trying to do as part of this effort, it's really about finding ways at a large scale and across all of biology to, to use technology in this way. Um, well, the other thing I think is really unique about just how we're set up, um, so we have these initiatives like education and science, um, we also have within the whole uh, uh, organization, we are building a very large software engineering team. Um, so this software engineering team will support all of the initiatives and a lot of it will be supporting science. Um, and this I think is really unique among philanthropies. Um, so there are not a lot of examples, uh, maybe one or two um, of, of sort of foundations and philanthropies that actually have their own very large in-house software engineering team that's sort of explicitly intended to work with um, and support the rest of the initiative. Um, and what I'm most excited about is that I think this opens up lots of different models um, for how we can incorporate software engineering into the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and it's been very interesting and a little bit overwhelming to think about all the different ways that we might uh, leverage that and might find ways to use that software engineering resource. Um, so what I wanna do now um, in, 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 in the rest of this talk um, is basically take you uh, through and sort of talk through 
three areas, three sort of project areas that we're exploring. Um, and I wanna stress this is extremely early. We are just getting started, we are ramping up. Um, but I thought it'd be fun, especially to give a little bit of a sort of look inside uh, what it's like to try to figure out what projects to work on, um, how we're thinking about that, um, and, and tell you about three areas that we're thinking about exploring, um, each of which in some ways connects back to things I was trying to do here and is informed by things I learned while I was here. Um, so I'm gonna take you through those. Um, the first one, each one is sort of around, around a theme. Um, the first one is, is, is around data sharing. And data sharing is a, it's an enormously uh, complicated issue. Um, I think the challenges really can't be uh, 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 understated. Um, to, to me, the challenge of data sharing is the fact that uh, ideally we would like all scientists working on a problem to be able to share data with each other, look at what each other is doing, collaborate more effectively. Um, the reality on the ground is that I know individual labs where two postdocs in the same lab can't share data with each other because they've adopted different standards and different formats and they're using different tool chains and as a result they can't even sort of talk to each other about the data, uh, let alone analyze it together. Um, so it's this sort of enormous problem where we wanna solve the problem for the entire community, but we have cases where we can't even solve the problem of going from one person to two people. Um, so I think there've been a lot of efforts to try to, across lots of biology, um, including some I was involved in here, um, that have been to some extent successful to try to start improving the way we share and standardize data. Um, and one of the big challenges, and I've talked to other, this is sort of as we've been evolving these ideas, talked to other foundations and other groups. Um, one of the challenges that especially when you are funding or, 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 or sort of supporting work that's happening across multiple sites, say 20 different labs, you wanna fund them and part of what you want them to do is share data with each other. Well, they might say that's great, um, we'd love to tell us how to do it. So now they actually need a way to share that data. Um, and that means they need some kind of platform or some kind of infrastructure. So what I think is really interesting about what we think we might be able to do um, as part of this initiative is to try to do both of those things at once. Um, what we'd like to try to do is actually support um, some area of science and then fund a bunch of groups to do work in that area and then simultaneously build technology for them that facilitates their ability to share and coordinate all of their efforts with each other. Um, so that's kind of the vision, and I think to do this, you wanna start by picking a fairly concrete problem. Um, so the area that we're trying to do it in, um, sort of for other reasons was, was an area of interest to us, um, is a project called the Human Cell Atlas. Um, so this is a project that is not ours. Um, this is a, uh, you can read about it at humancellatlas.org. Um, this is an effort to comprehensively uh, map and organize knowledge about all cells in the human. Um, so you know, we know a lot about the human body, we know a lot about different organs, we know a lot about different tissues. Um, of course, you can keep going all the way down to individual cells and uh, despite, or in a few areas, we know a few organs, we know a lot about different cell types, a lot of great examples from neuroscience, um, but sort of systematically, comprehensively across an entire human, we don't have um, a, a sort of catalog or characterization of all cell types. Um, and the goal of this project is to build such a resource um, and with the goal of both being a reference for biology, but also a reference within a human uh, of all cell types for the purpose of understanding disease. So this is a, a resource that the community, this very large community has agreed would be valuable. Um, and this project is really coming out of, um, it's sort of a loose federation that's growing very quickly that includes the Broad Institute, which is in Boston, um, the EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, and Sanger in, in the UK, um, also UC Santa Cruz. Um, all these groups have had a long history of doing um, large-scale genomics projects, um, and they have now, with many, many others, embarked on, on this big effort. So again, we didn't start this, but uh, Corey, um, and then sort of Corey convinced me that there was a real opportunity, um, just as this project is getting off the ground, um, to try to do a couple of things that would help ex accelerate it and support it. Um, and the thing we saw immediately was that, uh, as with many projects in science, there was already starting to be a sort of siloing of uh, what you might think of as data sharing, um, where individual institutes were starting to talk about building sort of repositories and architectures for sharing data within each of those groups, um, but not doing it in a way that was sort of coordinated and common to all. 
Um, so what we're doing here, um, again, really just with the goal of supporting and accelerating this project, um, is sort of taking a two-pronged two approach. Um, so the first part, um, and this actually was our very first uh, 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 request for application, so one of the many things we'll do at this initiative is give grants, um, but I would say that's actually only a small part of what we'll ultimately do. Um, so this is a case where we just uh, literally yesterday um, put out our first request for applications. Um, the goal here is to fund uh, labs, fund experimental labs that are doing research in this area. And in this case of the Cell Atlas, um, this is an area that's super exciting in terms of the technologies that are being used. There are uh, uh, single cell, uh, things like single cell RNA sequencing uh, to characterize patterns of gene expression um, across cells and understand how they, they differ. But there are also really exciting methods based on things like image-based transcriptomics and all kinds of other ways of characterizing um, uh, uh, the, the properties that differentiate cells. Um, because there's so much technology development, there's a real need to understand uh, and sort of establish best practices around a lot of these techniques. There are lots of methods, including some that were, are discussed here in this building, um, where we don't really know, uh, you know how these different methods systematically compare to each other. They're not being benchmarked. They're not being evaluated um, because it's moving so quickly. So we want to partly fund labs that will do this sort of systematic comparison work um, that is something that I think is not sometimes supported, but not always supported by um, the sort of broader funding efforts in science um, to do just systematic evaluation and establishing the best practices. Part of establishing best practices is to have labs collect data in a form that can then be compared and shared with each other. If you're trying to figure out whether your result is similar to a result that's already been published, it's really frustrating to read the already published paper and not be able to get access to the raw data, for example. Or if you do get access to the raw data, to have it be in some completely different form. So what we're trying to do is simultaneous to funding this work uh, is to help build a architecture and a platform that will enable all of these groups to share all the data that they're collecting with each other in as open um, and sort of standardized a form as possible. Um, so again, this effort, we're, we're, I would say, doing everything we do collaboratively. Um, so this particular case is a collaboration with the Human Cell Atlas project itself, um, as well as those groups I mentioned, EBI, Broad, uh, UCSC, um, as well as us. And we are uh, building a diagram that I won't go through in enormous detail, except to say that um, it uh, has a few sort of key properties. You know, fundamentally in this project, we're going to be, uh, we, the entire effort is going to be collecting data from lots of different labs. So somehow we have to have data from lots of different labs to go into some kind of common system um, where there's at least some minimal checking that the data have the right format. Um, if there are metadata tags associated with the data, they have to be formatted the right way. Um, and then all that data needs to go into uh, uh, what we're thinking of as a sort of primary data archive. And the goal here is to make it as openly accessible as possible. Um, we want everything we do, I should say, as part of this initiative to be as open as possible, and especially that when it comes to data, it's really important that if we're collecting large data sets as part of a coordinated effort like this, that data needs to be available to as many researchers as possible. Um, researchers as well as people in the clinical world or anywhere else. Um, so we have a, a strong goal of that. Now, the thing about data is that it doesn't often mean much until you start analyzing it, and we need to have some way to support the various kinds of analyses that are going to be done on these data. Um, some of those analyses um, shown in the screen box here result in outputs that then need to go back into this archive because they will be of use to other researchers. Um, other analyses can just sort of live off on their own. So we're trying to architect a system that uh, allows us to have all the data as available as openly as possible um, and can then be sort of supported by and extended by as many different analyses as possible. Um, so this has really been a process of listening to all, you know, these other groups, EBI, Broad, and Santa Cruz, they're experts in how to do this kind of thing. What we're trying to do with this initiative is to bring a certain kind of software engineering perspective to how to architect this kind of thing um, and make sure it happens in a coordinated way and in a way that's as open as possible. And then, because we're also funding work, to make sure that the work we fund ends up using this data architecture that we help build. Um, so the themes here really are openness and accessibility um, of the architecture, making it as extensible as possible and sort of reusable as possible. You know, although we are building this for this one project, we want everything we build to be usable by other projects that have similar forms um, and, and really ultimately maximizing the innovation that can come downstream. So 
This is one sort of example. You can think of it as a, a pilot for how to support data coordination and data sharing in science. Um, I'm really excited about it, and uh, you'll find out in six months if it was successful or not. Um, <laughs> so the second, uh, the second example, um, and this is an area that's sort of near and dear to my heart because it's a lot of what I thought about while I was here, um, is computational tools for microscopy. Um, so you saw, saw earlier uh, an example of uh, some of the coolest uh, micro microscopy technology coming out of, of this place. Um, and you know these kinds of movies are rich, they're interesting, there's a lot of structure, there's a, a lot of information. Um, and there's some fundamental challenges in how we quantify that information. You know, we can't just look at a movie, we have to somehow turn it into uh, quantified data that can then be combined with other kinds of data, um, as well as be uh, sort of put into more complex analyses. Um, there are also really big challenges with how to store and share these kinds of data um, that to some extent uh, go beyond even some other cases in genomics or other kinds of data, largely due to the fact that these uh, movies get really big really quickly. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about, you know, we're not like at the scale of Google or something, um, but uh, any one of these experiments can be anywhere from many, many gigabytes to terabytes, um, and that gets pretty big pretty quickly, especially because you're doing these experiments all the time. Um, so how to share them in a systematic way and organize them um, is, is really quite a challenge. Um, so this particular kind of data is something I thought a lot about and was very involved in. Um, I've recently been uh, sort of, to some extent, trying to zoom out and think about broader kinds of data, something uh, this is also a movie from an incredible instrument, the Lattice Light Sheet Microscope, developed here at Genalia. Um, this movie comes from Wes um, and, and Eric Betzig and Bai Chen, Cheng Chen. Um, and we are watching uh, literally a movie of a T cell engulfing an antigen presenting cell um, and seeing it dynamically uh, at high spatial resolution, high temporal resolution. Um, you know, these technologies in general let us look at things that we've never been able to see before. Um, and, you know, to me, what we really just want to do is make it possible and as fast as possible to do these experiments and attract meaning from them, um, but that requires analyzing these kinds of data in a systematic way. Um, and recently, just chatting with Wes about this particular movie, um, you know, there are things that, that Wes wants to quantify when he looks at this, um, and it's really complicated to how to, uh, as to how to go from the raw movie to the kinds of biological quantification that we're ultimately interested in. Um, let alone other issues of how do you store or share this thing. Um, I think something Wes told me about this paper when they published it, um, the journal said that they wanted access to all the raw data, um, that it would be great to include that as part of the paper. And then Wes said, okay, well, you know, it's, we're talking about like 20, I don't know, 20 terabytes or something. And the journal said, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> like, don't, you know, don't worry about it. Um, so, you know, that's, 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 we should, fix that, right? We should, it should be possible to share um, these kinds of data and do that in a systematic way. Um, so for this particular problem, um, partly in the spirit of zooming out and really in the spirit of just listening to the community, um, at uh, CZI, uh, we've taken a cue uh, from something Janalia did really early on in its lifetime, which was to hold workshops where we bring together experts from the community. Um, so we've been doing a couple of these workshops. Um, uh, oh, sorry, this is just to say, uh, let me show a photo of the workshop. So, um, this, I think, is a really fun photo because there's a lot of genalia going on here. Um, so this is a photo from the very first workshop we did on computational tools for microscopy. Um, this is Viren Jain. He used to be at Genalia and he's now at Google. Um, this is Fernando Mott, who uh, used to, also used to be at Genalia and is now at Netflix. Um, this is Nathan Clack, who's sort of uh, with Vidrio, which is affiliated with, with Genalia and is still here, maybe is here in the room. Um, as well as Ian Carpenter from the Broad Institute and then a bunch of engineers um, or three software engineers from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, so these workshops have been very much in the spirit of bringing people together um, with different perspectives and different skill sets to talk about um, these issues and try to come up with ideas about how to make progress. Um, and the theme of this workshop was basically that there is a lot of stuff out there for solving these problems, um, but it's also very fragmented. Um, so it doesn't matter exactly what each of these logos is, but the most important thing is that each one of these is a project that has been developed by some research group um, to solve a problem related to analyzing or sharing um, microscopy data. So some of these projects are about um, doing faster, you know, really fast computation to make it faster to do even sort of basic operations. Some of these projects are about doing things like segmentation. If I have a cell in a picture, how do I segment the boundaries of that cell? 
um, maybe sort of tracking particles within these complicated movies. Um, and really the theme, I would say the theme and what came out of the workshop from everyone there is that there's a lot of really great work being done in this space, um, but a lot of different things are being developed and a lot of those things are being reinvented. Um, and I think the challenge we're, we're faced with right now is to figure out how to support an area like this, um, really at a, at a broad scale. Um, I think if, if there's something, if there are already seven tools out there in the community, we don't want to make the eighth tool. Um, we feel pretty strongly about that. Um, maybe if the seven are really bad and like the eighth would be really good, but I think that's a trap that you fall into. Um, so instead we wanna find ways of you know, figuring out why are there seven to begin with um, and how can we maybe work with the entire community to figure out how to raise up all of those efforts and maybe find ways to coordinate them or facilitate them in some ways. Um, so as part of this workshop, uh, we spent a lot of time basically with this group. We had developers of each of the kind of key open projects, open source projects in this area all come together. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would be useful um, both to this community um, as well as uh, things useful that we might be able to do. Um, and I can't say we're, we know what we're gonna do yet because we truly don't. Um, but it was a really valuable experience. And three kind of clear things that came out um, that I do think we're gonna try to work on. I just don't know exactly how yet. Um, one is better understanding our users. Um, so this is a really striking uh, difference, the time now that I've spent hanging out with software engineers who come from the world of sort of consumer technology. Um, the very first thing you do is think about your users. Um, if you're gonna build, I don't know, something like Facebook, um, you figure out who is gonna use it and you figure out if the tool you're building is satisfying the users. Um, and I think that's a mindset that is, is really quite valuable um, and could be valuably applied to things like tools for science. Um, I think one of the things we learned from this workshop is that the developers of each of these key technologies, these existing tools for, for image analysis, um, they take a very different mindset, right? They're sort of focused on what are the interesting research problems, and you know, if my colleague down the hall wants to analyze a new kind of data, I'll build, I'll like add a feature to support this new kind of data, as opposed to asking sort of systematically, given everything my user community is interested in, what would be the most important thing for me to develop right now? Um, so at a high level, we are very interested in actually just finding out in a more systematic way. Um, we were sort of surprised that this hasn't really been done before. Um, what is the user community for these kinds of tools? What do they need? What would be useful? Um, where are the bottlenecks? And really doing that comprehensively and using that to, to design um, our plans. Um, in general, we also felt that uh, there's just an enormous need for tools that are easier to use. Um, and I think this is, again, something that uh, we are often, and I would say I was just as, you know, everything I built, um, and, and we did, in my group, develop tools for this kind of analysis. Um, I think in science, we have a, we're really good at building really cool tools and technologies that are really useful to about 5% of biologists. Um, and what we don't do is figure out how to, you know, then turn that into something that is gonna be useful for the remaining uh, uh, 95, or even just another 20%. Um, and it comes from the fact that technology evolves really quickly, um, and especially these sort of complex tools for things like analyzing images, um, the field moves really quickly, it's really hard to keep up, um, and as a result, we end up with tools that are complicated and hard for lots of people to use. Um, so that was another theme. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of interest around uh, sort of benchmarking um, that, again, maybe is a sort of theme as well with the previous work, um, that for a lot of problems, especially around image analysis, um, there was agreement that there'd be value in bringing together you know, lots of different data sets where we actually know what the answer is, we know what ground truth is, and then make it really easy for people to get access to those data sets. Um, and uh, make that as available as possible. And this really has been productive in the world of computer vision. So everyone's probably had the experience of using something, uh, I don't know, whether it's like Google image search where you, you know, search for a name and you see a photo of the thing you're looking for. Um, that's essentially because we've gotten really good at doing object recognition in, in, in machine learning. And one of the reasons we're really good at object recognition is that about 10 years ago, um, there was a data set that was the standard benchmark data set for object recognition. It was pictures of tens of thousands of objects and a label for every single one. Um, and the fact that that data set existed for so long meant that all these researchers who were trying to solve this problem had a really clear thing to go to to figure out if their methods were good or not. 
And we identified at this workshop a bunch of areas in microscopy where we might be able to either help or sort of work with the community to collect really systematically benchmark data sets with ground truth that could then hopefully spur the, that kind of development and really make progress on some of these areas. So the third one, um, in some ways this is the broadest, um, is an area that I'll call knowledge sharing. Um, and this is really about how we as scientists communicate with each other um, and share the work that we're doing with other people. Um, and this is a really complicated area um, for a variety of reasons. I think the, the common point, the thing we can all sort of agree on, is that the way we do it now is not very good. Um, and I think that's a good starting point, because um, that means we all at least think there should be change. So for those who sort of aren't, aren't steeped in this, the way it works now is that we basically have these documents um, that are our scientific papers that we produce, um, and we write them, we send them to journals, they get reviewed, it takes a really long time, um, and then eventually they come out um, in publications. And these documents are static, um, they are typically PDF files, that's how we consume them, um, which is great if you wanna print it, but as I was just talking to with Nelson, it's actually really hard to even read it on your phone, which was not a problem 10 years ago, but um, it is a problem now, because um, Nelson wants to read on his phone. And uh, you know, more to the point, uh, this is an incredibly static way to represent data. Um, something that uh, David here has spoken really eloquently about. You know, if I have a figure and I want to sort of jump in and figure out, you know, well, what was the raw data that went into this figure? How do I sort of know whether the analysis was done correctly or not? Did they use the right statistics? If all I have is this PDF document, I can't do that, right? Um, uh, so there's no data. Uh, certainly code that was used to generate this, we don't have access to that usually. Um, it's not interactive. Um, it's hard to reproduce. So if I think this is a really cool analysis and I want to do it, I'm run it on my data, well, all I have is this PDF document, right? Um, and the last thing is sort of discoverability. There's a lot of science out there, right? Um, there, I mean, sort of numbers of papers that have been published in biology is just growing every year. There's an enormous amount of content. No one has time to read every single one of these PDF documents. Um, and right now, I think the way a lot of people hear about papers is either your colleague in the hall tells you to read something, or maybe you go on Twitter and someone tweets about a cool paper. Um, and that's actually how a lot of scientists I talk to find out what to read. Um, and again, we're sort of in this world of just sharing these PDF documents. Um, so you know, it's easy to say that there are issues. The real hard problem is how do we make progress? Um, and how do we start moving towards uh, towards better approaches. Um, again, I don't know the answer, so we held a workshop. Um, uh, this is a little pamphlet from the workshop. Um, and this was called The Future of Scientific Knowledge, and we tried to bring together um, really leaders from the community, people on the side, like publishers of journals. We brought uh, people in various philanthropies that are trying to fund this kind of work. Um, we made a point to also bring a bunch of people from the world of, of software development and technology which has, and I'll give a couple examples of this, have made a lot of really cool progress on, at least at the sort of technical level, what a future sort of might look like, like how we could start sharing code and data in better ways. Um, we try to bring a lot of those people, um, also to be in conversation with people more on the journal side and the publisher side, just to try to see as a group, could we brainstorm about uh, what we as a community could do differently, and especially what we in this initiative um, could find a way to help with. Um, it was a really, really fun workshop. Uh, this is Corey talking to Richard Sever. So Richard Sever runs something called BioArchive, um, which has been a really cool uh, example of something of a success story in this world. So BioArchive, um, for those that don't know, is a preprint server. Um, so this is an idea, uh, uh, the idea of preprints have been around in physics for a long time. Um, it only came recently to biology. And the idea is that instead of sending your paper to a journal where you then have to wait months or years for people to review it before it gets published, why don't you just post it on the internet um, as soon as you finish it? Uh, that's really the, that's the whole idea. Um, it's not particularly radical, um, but this has actually created a huge stir in the world of biology. Um, and I think it's really cool, it's really exciting that people want to be sharing what they're doing quicker and more frequently. Um, of course, you then have an issue, which is that there's an enormous amount of content that ends up out there, because if every biologist is put in their paper on BioArchive the moment they finish it. Um, I think we've all seen in the context of things like uh, quote unquote fake news, um, we've seen uh, it, truth matters, right? <laughs> I think we can agree on that. Um, and there is value in knowing whether something is true or not. Um, so I, I, you know, review is important, 
Um, but I do think this kind of uh, sort of effort to share more frequently that comes from things like Bower Archive is really exciting. Um, what we really talked about at this workshop and we learned about this workshop or from this workshop um, is really there's sort of uh, two key areas. There's content creation and there's content discovery. Um, so creation is how, as a scientist, do I put out what I've done into the world? Um, what form do I do it in? Um, you know, I think what we're struggling with is that the vast majority of scientists write a paper in Microsoft Word, um, and then they print it and turn it into a PDF, and that's what they send to the journal. Um, and if we want to start finding ways for scientists to share data and share code and make it interactive and reproducible, we have to somehow move beyond that. Um, we also want discovery. We want to make it easy for scientists to find what's out there and search it. But, and this is a crucial thing, for both of these things, we have to make it easy for all biologists to use. And I would say this is the biggest theme that came from this workshop and what we're, we're hearing from the community is that, again, if we build a really cool, or we or anyone, build a really cool technology that makes it easier for scientists to share their code and data, but only 1% of biologists can use it, um, Maybe over time it'll start to get adoption, but I don't think that's going to make a big. It's not going to make a big change right now. Um, so we simultaneously want to have these goals of putting more content out and creating it and making it more discoverable. But we have to do it in a way that raises all of biology and not just the very small subset that can use these sort of more technically sophisticated tools. Um, that being said, there are some really cool tools that are out there. Um, so one is uh, something called Jupiter, and this I was very involved in. Uh, while I was here at Genelia, um, maybe a couple people have run across this. Um, this is a, a really cool way of basically reimagining the document. Um, so unlike a static PDF, this is a document that literally lives in a web browser. That's what I'm showing here. Um, and in this document, you have uh, text, um, as you'd expect, but you also have code. And that code can be written in any programming language. And that code can be evaluated to generate figures uh, and this document can also load in and display data. So it is sort of, uh, you can think of it as kind of a modern scientific paper in the sense that it brings together the code and the data and the figures all into a executable document. Um, so this is a, I think, super exciting technology. Again, very cool and very restricted probably to a tiny subset of biologists who uh, are sort of comfortable with and, and able to use um, and sort of interested in trying and spending time on learning these technologies. So it's really exciting, but there's also a lot of work to be done to somehow make this kind of thing available to all of biologists. Um, when I was here at Genelia, I worked on something um, called Binder, which uh, I would basically say has the same properties. Um, so this was a way of uh, going beyond just the document. If I now want to have, for a scientific project, the document like the one I just showed, but also all of the raw data and actually the environment in which I was doing all of my analysis and then package that whole thing together into a form that anyone can sort of just in a web browser click on and, and immediately be recapitulating the exact same analysis that I did for my study um, and how to make that as easy as possible for people to share. That's the problem that Binder tries to solve. Um, and again, I would say I think it, it does solve it, but it solves it for a very, very, very small subset of biologists who uh, can sort of learn and use and, and embrace this particular ecosystem of tools. Um, and I, I would say the biggest thing I learned working on these kinds of projects is that on the one hand, they do start to solve some of these problems, but they don't do it in a way that's going to scale to all of, uh, definitely not all of biology, even a, even a particularly large subset. Um, so again, I don't have an answer as to how to do that, um, but I do think what we're trying to do or we're starting to think about doing um, with our team as part of this initiative is to leverage the fact that we will have a very, very, very large group of software engineers, and especially a large group of software engineers who are used to thinking about um, specifically this aspect of software development, not just how do you sort of build the prototype that's cool, but how do you take a prototype and build it into a professional product that lots and lots of people are able to use and want to use. Um, and that's an attitude that I think um, you know, again, there's sort of the corporate, I mean, that's been used in consumer technology. Um, but what I'm really excited about is that we're going to try to take that perspective and apply it to open source development of openly available tools for scientists. Um, and to, I think that has at least the potential to take these kinds of cool prototype technologies and actually make them things that lots of scientists want to use. Um, the last aspect of, of scientific knowledge is not just how do you produce all this content, as I said, but how do you discover it? Um, and I was just chatting with Jerry 
um, about the fact that for him, Google Scholar is basically the state of the art. Um, and Google Scholar is pretty good, um, but you know, it's also very, very simple. You basically search for papers by their title and their author and a few other things, maybe the journal they were published in. Um, and you know, there's a lot of content out there. With things like BioArchive, there's gonna be a lot more content out there that's gonna grow over time. We need to have some way to search and organize and structure all of that knowledge. Um, and we, uh, that's something we're very interested in. Um, we're so interested in it that we actually acquired a company. Um, so this is sort of an unusual thing for a philanthropy to do. But um, basically there's this group called Meta and they've been building um, a, a set of artificial intelligence technologies for mining the scientific literature. Um, so they go out and they extract information from more or less every published paper. They're trying to get as many as they can. Um, and then they organize it and do various kinds of machine learning on it to identify concepts and identify relationships and then provide tools that let people search and explore those relationships and, and really discover um, the structure of scientific knowledge. Um, what's cool about Meta is that they're basically former academics who I think deeply never really wanted to turn this into a company, but it was sort of the only way they could support this kind of work. Um, so they're super excited to join us because by now being as part of uh, CZI, we can make everything they've done available and open freely to the scientific community. So we're basically, by joining us, we make what they've done open. Um, and I think that's a model we'll use in, in probably other ways as well. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for them to be working and attacking some of these problems. Um, again, this is a very, very hard problem, but it also feels really needed right now just given the volume of work that's being put out there. Um, and I think it's gonna be especially exciting to think simultaneously about discovery the way Meta has and also these areas of content creation and dissemination and try to put these two things together. Um, and that is our vision for um, how we might uh, at least start to approach this uh, pretty daunting problem of knowledge sharing in science. So I hope that was sort of an interesting uh, tour through uh, both kind of what I learned here and, and which was an enormous amount um, that I'm really grateful for. Um, and what uh, we're trying to do is we just get started at this initiative. It's only been four months, um, so I hope to have uh, a lot more updates and hope to share. We wanna be super open and transparent about everything we're doing. Um, any of these projects are gonna be, all the data is gonna be open, all the code is gonna be open, um, and we'll be open about the kinds of things we develop over time, and I hope to do, hope we can do good things. Um, so you can check out the website for more um, and stick around for questions. Thank you very much. I picked them, okay, great. Yeah, hello. Wow, this is the, a different microphone. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, so I have uh, two questions. One's really short and, and fun. The other one's a little bit more deep. So on the mice brains, when you're looking at them with the microscopes, how deep into the brains can you see? Is it just the surface or how, how, how deep into the brains can you see? So we can go uh, pretty far down. So a lot of those images are from layer two, three. Um, wow. But uh, imaging all the way down to layer four is, is and five to its minimal extent. There are various parameters like um, sort of the density of expression of these fluorescent uh, proteins. If you do it in too many cells, you start to get things like scattering of light, which makes it harder to resolve fairly, fairly deep down. But yes, quite deep. Wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, so the, you know, the, this bit about all the data is really interesting and, so, um, and, and, and very exciting. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, you're talking about data mining and, and uh, data sets and systems talking to each other. And what I'm wondering is, is this gonna have some self-learning that you think that you're gonna end up with? And if, if it does, is that something that would apply to other um, industries or, or businesses or government? And, and I'm thinking, for example, about like the Veterans Affair where, affairs where we found out that they had two different health uh, care systems that couldn't talk to each other and it was just so painful. And, and so if, if you end up with tools where you can data mine and have systems learn how to talk to each other, you know, is that something that's applicable across different industries? That's wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I think the short answer is that it absolutely will like, is likely to be relevant to other industries. Um, I think we, you know, it's sort of funny. On the one hand, this mission is about, uh, is about fundamentally health and disease. Um, I think we've taken the attitude of, at least right now, focusing on supporting basic science and technology, um, but that will evolve over time. And, and whether it's sort of things we do explicitly in, in domains like healthcare, um, or just sort of through osmosis by building things that have sufficient generality to be used in other domains, I think absolutely. Um, you know, we are very much intending 
again, for any technology we build, any of the tools that power these systems will be openly available and uh, in some cases probably designed so that they can be used by other groups even if the, we're not the ones doing it. Um, so that is. Can you talk about the self-learning So, So yeah, maybe uh, it would help me to clarify. So self you mean sort of uh, a system that can start to learn how to do its own kind of analysis? Yeah, so I think right now that's a hard problem. I mean, in, yeah, in principle, it's a hard problem. Um, I think in cases we've looked at for getting lots of sort of disconnected systems to interact, some of that has to be done with a little bit of human engineering. It's literally getting the people from the different institutes into the same room to reach some agreement about, you know, what are the standards we're going to use to build these systems to make sure they can all talk to each other. Um, but there are efforts in place to sort of learn how to translate between different systems that have different sort of communication protocols. Um, I think that area is probably going to grow a lot over the next couple of years. Very cool problem. This is a, a wonderful open system. What happens, especially in biology, where you run into corporations, corporations that could take some of your data, patent things, and maybe even stymie, stymie some of the research? Yeah. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, so we are our philosophy right, of right now, and this really is, I can say, sort of about these projects at least, um, is that we know that open means open, and and we're okay with, uh, for example, in the context of the cell atlas, um, we feel it's most important for this project um, for all the data to be as openly available as possible. Um, all the work we're funding, we want to be fully consented. Um, something we heard from other large genomics projects is that data that was closed, even had even data that had like some minimal form of access control, was used a hundred to a thousand times less by the research community than the data that was fully open. So our perspective is, <clears throat> if you're going to support science, you you want to make sure you're in that category of being as widely used as possible. And if pharmaceutical companies or drug companies or people want to take these kinds of data, they want to use it, they want to make profit on it. Um, then that's okay. Um, at least with respect to this project, that is our, that is our perspective. Um, I do think, I certainly acknowledge there are cases where um, things like taking out IP um, can be value, actually valuable from the purpose of dissemination. Um, you know, I think if knowledge dissemination is your goal, uh, there are different strategies for how to do it as quickly as possible. Um, so I think we'll, you know, we have lots of ways to explore these areas, but at least definitely in these cases that I've talked about, um, we know that open means open and we're very committed to that. Hi, I was wondering if there is a specific um, social networking organization for scientists, or if not, if there could be one developed. I know some other groups of people who have a common interest have set up particular social networking um, organizations that allow them to share information, and some of them work really well. And I was wondering if something like that exists, exists for scientists, or it could exist for scientists. That would be open to all scientists. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, it's a great thought and a great question. Um, I don't know about too many that I've seen that have really kind of really taken off. Um, you know, obviously, lots of scientists use Twitter um, and these sort of <laughs> other large uh, social networks. Um, uh, weirdly, I don't know. A lot of scientists use Twitter and not Facebook. I don't know why. Um, so I think there are examples of social networks that are being used by scientists, but that's different than, than sort of networks. Um, something, I think in the case of, of things like publishing, the, the sort of area I talked about at the end, I think there would be huge value in sort of open systems for discussing uh, a sort of research output. Um, and that, you know, that actually, if you think about, uh, well, I think there's, there's a lot of potential value there. Um, there have been a few sort of efforts in that direction that haven't really taken off. Um, you know, for example, BioArchive, the preprint server I mentioned, has a commenting section. In principle, people could be using that all the time to talk to each other about their work. Um, I think the statistic is that 15% of papers on BioArchive have any comments. Um, so I don't know if people, and it's sort of weird because scientists clearly have opinions about uh, other people's work. So for whatever reason, they're not going on to BioArchive to leave comments. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's a really, how to create social like actual sort of vibrant social networks is really an art. Um, it, it takes a dedicated community, but it also takes building the tools and the websites and everything really to make them very good and very uh, compelling for people to use. 
So I think we, whether it's sort of through meta or some of this publishing stuff, we sort of try to explore that. I think we probably will, um, but we'll think very carefully about how to make sure it works. Yeah, so software uh, licenses have built-in protections for people taking the software and using it in commercial. Is there anything equivalent in the data world where you could have a data license? And you can make it viral, like the software says, if you use it, you have to make the changes uh, open source as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I And maybe you can start that. There's, yeah, there's some, <laughs> interesting. Well, so when it comes to software, I'm sort of an advocate for the truly permissive light, the ones that just, like MIT, where you just sort of put it out and then anyone can do anything with it. Um, it's all about sort of, you know, how you feel about wanting to encourage maximal innovation basically downstream. Um, with data, I mean, I think things around like Creative Commons, um, that's been used to apply to, some of the audience might know this better than me, um, it's been used to apply to things like papers. Um, so, for example, when you put a preprint on BioArchive, you pick a license. That's not data per se, but it's also not code. It's sort of, it is, a, it's an, I think it's created as like, a, it's a creative artifact. Yeah. Um, so there are some licenses for those kinds of objects. A sort of pure license for data, no, usually people share their data set and they say, if you use this, please cite me. That's sort of the state of the art. A couple over here. The, the program assert or mentions the fact that you have a great passion for open source and open science. For those of us who are not very well informed, could you comment just briefly about what open source and open science is and then briefly discuss some of the pros and cons for it? Yeah, that's uh, a great question, um, and it touches on things we've been, been discussing. Um, so open source is really, it's a, it's a very specific term about code, um, that when I write code to, uh, usually in the, I mean, in, in our field, in the context of either analyzing data, or maybe I write computer code that powers some of these kinds of systems we're talking about, um, open source means that that code is made available freely to the rest of the research community for them to use in whatever way they want. Um, so that is sort of the, now there are different licenses that permit that kind of use, but that's really what it's about. Um, open science is a broader term that's really, a, I think, more as a philosophy of how to think about sharing and sort of knowledge dissemination within science, um, data sharing. Um, and it's a way of sort of thinking about how we do science that tries to be as collaborative and open as possible. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in various ways, everything we're trying to do, we're trying to reflect those two principles. Does that help? As you're doing this, how do you measure that you're successful? And if you're finding yourself going in the wrong direction, what's your feedback to change your process or your approach or your team to go in a different direction? So that's a wonderful question. Um, and it's something we, we think about a lot. Uh, I mentioned how the sort of the perspective of the consumer tech world has been really interesting to learn. A lot of wh where they come from is like, very aggressive about measuring success um, and sort of uh, metrics and such. So I would say we're starting off really by listening, um, by doing things like these workshops and talking to the community as we start to actually build projects. Um, and again, the form may be very different. Maybe we'll actually build a software tool. Maybe we will fund scientists. Maybe we will work collaboratively with other groups that are already out there. Um, I think it's gonna depend on the, on the kind of work we're doing. Um, for tools that we build, I think it's reasonably straightforward, or at least we can borrow tricks that have come from the world of consumer technology. It's, whether it's number of users or monitoring various things about how users are using the tool, um, you know, how much data are they putting into this thing, how is it being analyzed, um, and I think we have a lot of, of expertise for how to do that kind of monitoring well. Um, uh, really, which is the goal of figuring out if your thing is working correctly. Um, for when you're funding science, um, uh, you know, I think anyone here is, is maybe as, uh, has a good as answer as I as to how to know whether you're successful because the time scales are so long. Um, you know, again, if you're funding sort of science that's more about sort of generating data sets that are going to be useful for doing certain kinds of standardization and benchmarking, well, then you can ask after six months, after a year, were those gen data sets generated? Are they being used by other people? Are they satisfying the goals? Um, for funding truly sort of science that may or may not work and, and happens over a long time scale. Um, I, I don't know if any of us quite know exactly the best way to track and evaluate it, but I think you, you just have to take a long view and you look what happens several years later. Oh, 
Okay. Join me in thanking Jeremy. Okay.